being recorded, um, if you're okay with your cameras being on and stuff. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone to our past lecture. Um, PAST is a collective of students who um, are at Portsmouth Architecture School. Um, and our aim is to um, create more community and networking between um, those studying architecture and the world of architecture and everything included in it. Um, and we run events like this. This is our lecture series, which is under the title Ecology Communities. And we are lucky enough to have Darren Bray today. So I will pass over to Diksha, who will introduce Hi, everyone. Today, Darren Bray is our speaker for the evening, and he passed out from Portsmouth Architecture School in 1996. He has been running his uh, a practice, Bad Architects, for two years now, and he is also teaching in Reading University. And today evening, he would be talking about three projects from his work. And over to you, Darren. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some names I can see out there. Okay, uh, so can you all see my presentation? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so thank you very much for the invite this evening. Um, I was just chatting to the guys about their title, which I think is perfect. Um, so um, some of you know me, some of you don't. Those of you who don't know me, uh, I studied at Portsmouth School of Architecture between 1993 and 1998, uh, doing my degree and postgrad there. Um, and uh, the, the journey's been interesting. Some of you out there will, will know some of these pictures, particularly Melanie Bertie, who's out there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so I started my journey back in the 1990s. If you look on the top right, you might just spot Roger Tyrrell, who gave me my first job at age 16, um, when I kind of trained as, a, as an architectural technician. Um, and then on the bottom right, uh, there's myself and my parents at my graduation in Guildhall Square in Portsmouth. It's quite scary because they look younger than I do now, which is, which is really scary. I guess architecture kind of does that to you. Um, so practice for myself has been sort of predominantly 22, 23 years in Hampshire uh, and prior to setting up my own practice, I was very fortunate to work for uh, people like Reformat Architects and Pad Studio. So these are a few projects um, that I kind of completed with Pad Studio um, over the last kind of 10, 12 years. Um, and, and so teaching for me is part of who I am, what I do. Uh, I've been teaching now for 13, 14 years, both as a studio tutor, as an um, external examiner and a part three examiner. The last uh, three slash four years, um, I've been teaching at Reading School of Architecture, um, which is a brand new school for those of you who don't know it, which is headed up by Lorraine Farrelly, who used to be my professor um, and a, a co-teacher at Portsmouth. Um, and at, at Reading, um, I've been teaching in first year, second year and third year over the last um, three or four years. Um, so one of the other things that we're extremely passionate about at, at, uh, at Studio BAD is, is research. Um, and my association and relationship um, with Roger Tyrrell has been a long one and I was very um, honoured to be able to contribute um, to his recent book. Um, I've also contributed to um, Alan Jones, the <coughs> Oregon President's um, latest book, um, which is quite interesting when I, when I kind of reflect on the fact that um, I basically sort of absolutely crashed my GCSEs because I am heavily dyslexic. It's quite um, amusing now that I'm asked to kind of write for people. Um, I have to kind of slightly pinch myself, but it takes me a lot longer than most people and, and poor um, Roger has to kind of read a great deal of my text um, and try to make them into something. Um, so in terms of our kind of research and thinking um, within the practice, we're, we're really, really quite passionate about um, kind of low energy design, and climate change. And, and this young lady has made us all kind of um, sit up and take notice. Um, I, I just find it incredible on a, on a Friday morning when she sends a tweet or an Instagram post and she's still kind of doing her thing and you know there are many of us that need to be doing more than you know what, what she's doing. Um, 
And, you know, we need to be thinking really quite hard what we're doing in, in architectural practice because, you know, we're, we're in a privileged position. And, and I think most of you out there that are um, studying architecture um, are going to be able to kind of make a huge change. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of an old dinosaur now and I'm just, you know, I'm still trying to, you know, make, make some kind of change within, within society and within the world. But, you know, my children and you guys have, have, have got, I've got a, um, you know, a fantastic opportunity to kind of make a huge impact. So we, we wrote the foreword to this book uh, last year with um, Doug Johnson, who runs Mesh Energy. Um, right first time this is all about you know trying to get design right in terms of low energy design and, and I'll talk a little bit about that with with the church with some of the wonderful work we've been doing there um, so again you know it's all it's all about activism and and uh, that's both you know sort of political activism and, and design activism and that's that's something that you know again we're hugely passionate about I mean we seem to be spending a great deal of time getting involved in politics now in in both Portsmouth and Southampton, and, and we're kind of learning a great deal through that process. Um, I borrowed this slide from um, Duncan Breaker Brown, who, who teaches at Brighton, and it's quite a scary slide, really, when you kind of look at this. That, that children born um, today, this is kind of um, what's what the situation is going to be globally. You know, sort of plus five degrees, and, and kind of you know where everybody's going to have to migrate. So this kind of just focuses the mind. Uh, so we, we set up the practice um, two years ago nearly, which is quite scary, and um, um, we decided to sort of stick our neck out, and this was a little interview we did with the Architects Journal where we said, you know, we, we want to change the public perception of the architects role, and I think uh, we're, we're, we're starting to make some inroads with that and starting to kind of, you know, um, make, make some noise. Um, so, uh, having been under the radar really for about a year, we kind of launched the, the website back in January and that's had a massive impact on, on kind, of, um, kind of workflow and, and kind of what we're doing um, and, and the kind of ethos of the, of the practice is one that's very much about narrative and, and, and it's about collaboration and, you know, our clients, um, you know, they're, they're not really clients, they're, they're part of our team really and, and it's about us learning from them and them learning from us. Um, so we we have a bunch of um, uh, kind of reprobates here they are uh, our sort of um, critical friends and uh, we are massively into getting our critical friends to um, question and reflect back to us about what we're doing um, and we, we sort of hold design reviews with these people some are architects some are academics uh, some are uh, experts in construction some are uh, photographers um, but it's about uh, this kind of shared process with, with everything that we do. So we're, we're based in Southampton, uh, which is uh, a, a kind of a, a port city, uh, renowned for um, kind of uh, processing uh, goods in and out of the place. And, and that's what Southampton feels as a place. It's just about to kind of launch a bid for City of Culture, which we're just starting to dip our toe and get involved in some of that with some of our clients here in, in the city. Um, so, you know, I guess we're quite passionate about um, social architecture. So what does that mean? And, and my great colleague, uh, Flora Samuel, wrote this book, Why Architects Matter. Um, which was kind of looking at, um, you know, what, what it is about architects that kind of, you know, change the world. And I, and I love this kind of, this quote, you know, why architects matter examines the role of research led ethical architects in promoting well-being, sustainable in innovation. And I, can, I think that kind of sums up, you know, what we, what we do. Um, I mean, social architects as an ideal work for the good of the people and the planet. And I'd like to think that we're kind of doing some of that. And, and the three projects I'm going to talk about tonight are, are very much about that. Um, you know, we're, we're working in, in this world where the high street is very much in the decline, but we're trying to work with clients to try to change that. And we're also working with, with clients um, around homelessness. So the first project I'm going to talk about tonight um, is a bookshop um, based, in, based in Southampton uh, in Portswood uh, High Street. Um, I was introduced to this project um, by Kate Baker, who... who who used to teach at Portsmouth, probably still does in some shape or form. Um, Kate was my first year tutor and Kate lives close to this, to this uh, bookshop and this collective. So they had this uh, crazy idea that they were going to buy an old redundant um, bank, the NatWest Bank, and here, here it is. 
you can see in this photograph, it's very much a very urban condition where it's got all, you know, it's got everything going on with, with society, with um, people sleeping rough outside it. Um, but the bookshop itself has been around for about 40 years and Owen Hatherley, who's an architectural um, writer, um, did his work yeah. into October books and, and kind of and wrote this small piece in The Guardian about it, um, probably about five or six years ago. So Claire here on the left had this had this kind of ridiculous idea that they would kind of do crowdfunding and sell loan stock and try and buy this bank. So we helped them to put together a proposal to the NatWest and bizarrely, um, their proposal was accepted to buy this bank. They were they were paying something like 1500 or 2000 pounds a month to uh, a, a local landlord. But the way that it worked was the, the, the was to bring on a joint venture partner. So another client, the Society of St. James, um, who do incredible work both here in Southampton, but also in Portsmouth. They run the little uh, cafe in, I think it's Victoria Park. Um, and predominantly they are looking after vulnerable people that might have had all sorts of mental health problems, addiction, domestic violence. They might have spent time in prison. So they came on board to take the first and second floor of, of this um, building. And, and um, in fact, Roger and I sort of met um, both these clients in a local cafe. And within five minutes, they managed to convince us and, and uh, Trevor here, the MD, to, to get on board and, and to run with the project. So we did some community engagement. And again, we were starting to learn about working with communities, but um, taking taking their brief and understanding what was what was really important to them. And when you kind of put together the, the kind of the community engagement and produce these kind of workloads, it's phenomenal, you know, kind of where this leads you to, because it's quite obvious, really. So community, what does that mean? It's a group of people living in the same place or having particular characteristic in common, a group of people living together or practicing common ownership a particular area of place considered together with its inhabitants. The people of a district or country consider collectively, especially in the context of social values and responsibilities. And we kind of share all of these with our clients. Mm. So when we started the project, one of the, one of the things that, that Roger kind of brought to the table was this idea of, of kind of living in the bookshop and this wonderful bookshop, Shakespeare and Co um, in Paris has this amazing mm. reputation where people kind of wander in, in the day and kind of not only they kind of read the books, but they sort of, you know, fall asleep in this place. So that this was a really quite powerful idea and image that kind of Rog brought to the, to the table. We then took the client off to, to London to go and look at some bookshops. And unfortunately, Claire got incredibly um, travel sick. And as we arrived in Waterloo, she literally threw up on the steps of Waterloo. And then we had to take her around all these bookshops to kind of inspire us. It was a, it was a slightly bizarre experience, but this, this is a bookshop um, that was produced by Second Home, it, uh, Second Home with the co-working guys, um, and their bookshop sits just across the road from, from the space. So we had this idea about kind of inhabiting, um, you know, the, the, the books. <clears throat> so here's, here's the bank. So literally it was a case of absolutely stripping everything out of this place. And I, you know, we're really passionate about existing buildings, but existing buildings, as, as you know, once you start to strip out all the stuff, they, they kind of don't leave you with, with much and your, your budget has to go an incredibly long way to try and you know, deliver what your client wants to do. Um, so this is a little bit about a process as well. So we're, we're massively into testing every single possible opportunity. Mm -hmm. We spend way too much time doing this, but I think when we present this back to a client, it's about being able to say, we know what works, we know what doesn't work. And for us, it was about kind of producing a street within the middle of the bank, the bookshop at the front. The, the kind of brown square here is the kind of um, cast in situ concrete vault, which we had to retain within the part of the bank because it, effectively, if we'd have take, tried to take it out, we'd have used our whole budget. Um, and then we started to kind of sketch out what the interior of the bookshop would be. So this is our little yeah. party diagram. So for those of you that go up, you know, listen to your um, tutors about, you know, what is it about a party diagram? So we're still doing that stuff in practice. It's just as important to kind of nail what the idea is. You know, here's the bookshop, here's the street, here's the kind of vault, and then here's the community space at the back. And then here are our kind of early sketches, this idea about um, being able to inhabit this kind of wall of, of books. So then we started to develop um, the kind of overall strategy for the bookshop. 
So um, we kind of shrunk the size of the bookshop and the idea was that the, the client was going to focus more on you know, specialist books. Here's the vault, which became the bookstore and then our kind of community space at the back. And in terms of the existing building, it, 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 it um, had quite an interesting sort of neoclassical um, facade at ground floor level, but beyond that, it was all quite mundane. So it was just a case of kind of cleaning up cutting out some of the stonework, put, putting in new windows to get daylight deep into the plan, and uh, just a new face, a new, a new simple facade. So here you, here you can see Rob from Darcy Construction. Here he is uh, trying to find out if there's any money still left in that little vault uh, for the, um, the cash machine. Um, we basically convinced the client to extract this cash machine out of the floor and try and design it back into the interior. But you can see, it took us weeks just to strip out all of the infrastructure that NatWest have kind of kept adding on and on and on on top of a sort of 20 or 30 years. Yeah. One of the interesting things was that once we stripped out the ceiling, we found that we didn't have this cast in situ concrete floor that had been cast after the timber floor had been put in. And this was all for security to stop people being able to get into the first floor and get into the heart of this bank and try and you know help themselves to the to the cash but we kind of used this we got an acoustic consultant to come in test it all and then we basically decided to kind of retain that and then we were able to kind of reduce the acoustic um, treatment between this level and the flats above so uh, again it was kind of really important for us to be able to um, use the budget really carefully. So our, our wall of books that was designed out of birch plywood, this was, this was quite a, a sum of money, but we managed to convince the client that this, this was kind of our main one interior piece. This is my um, daughter kind of trying out the kind of the wall of, of books. Uh, and quite interestingly, um, the old bookshop to the new bookshop uh, was a basically mm -hmm the length of 200 people yes. next to each other. Um, uh, so the client had this um, idea that on a Sunday afternoon, we'd all meet up, 200 of us, and we'd move all the books from one bookshop to the other. The client's brother took a little video and posted it on Twitter that afternoon. Um, by Monday um, morning, the Daily Echo picked it up. By Monday afternoon, BBC web website picked it up. Uh, by Tuesday, the New York Times picked it up, and by Wednesday, the Washington Post had, had picked it up. So this kind of story of this kind of collective community endeavour started to travel the world, and it just kind of showed the, the, the power of, of community in this, in this age. So here is everybody um, after we launched the, um, the, the new opening, and it's gone from strength to strength, and they've kind of doubled their um, takings. They've, they've got this kind of prominent position now on the high street in, in Portswood, and... The Society of St. James have, have got um, something like 11 um, clients that they're looking after on the, on the first and second floor of this building. And that, that uh, Christmas, uh, the bookshop um, appeared um, on Radio 4 and in the, in the Guardian. And then overnight, the Rebel Gardeners turned up with their, with, uh, who were the kind of local equivalent to Banksy, um, with their little planters. So you see here is the, uh, is the concrete vault, which we retained, kept the door. There's the, um, the vault from the cash machine, which we designed into the, into the counter. Here's the, the kind of the wall of books. And that's as it exists in, in the high street in Portswood. Um, I'm a real fan of, of, of Ai Weiwei's book, Humanity, um, and his film, and um, I just, I just kind of love that he sort of collects these wonderful quotes. You begin to understand that we all have the same basic needs, that our sense of humanity and integrity, our desire for warmth and safety, to be well treated and respected, are the same. So uh, our second major project is, is St Margaret's Church, which, you know, I still have to kind of pinch myself every day that, um, that we're involved with this project. And I, you know, I, I owe a great deal to, to Andrew Melwan to introducing us and inviting us to come and talk to the church about this project, because, you know, we're kind of learning from this project, you know, every single day that we're involved in it. And for us, um, getting involved in, in, a, in a church is, is kind of um, 
you, you have to kind of think really carefully about um, how you're going to talk to the client and the kind of general endeavor. And we, you know, we kind of chose two sort of key images. There's Ron Trump on the left, uh, and then there's just this idea that, um, you know, uh, the kind of warmth and light. Uh, we conceptualized that St. Margaret's community was, was almost like a vessel of light, and, and our design intention was to encourage that light to emerge into the community that it serves. And I think that's something that we're hopefully trying to hold on to as we move through the project. So I'm sure most of you know where St. Margaret's is on Highland Road, opposite, opposite the cemetery. It has this kind of really sort of prominent position. It's quite interesting that it sits in a conservation area, but it's only really these little terraced houses here that kind of define that conservation area. So um, we, we're quite a, very mindful of that every time we have to kind of um, talk to the planners or put a plan application. So here it is, there's Mr. Tyrrell in the picture. Um, um, this was the day that we were kind of doing our community engagement. So we were instructed to, or appointed to do a feasibility study to look at what the future of, of church and this church might be in the 21st century. And we have this kind of quite wonderful day where, where um, one of the key moves was to move the church from the kind of community um, church hall building that they were inhabiting back into this building. This building had been condemned by the archdeacon sort of four or five years ago when Andrew and Fran and the team had, had kind of scrimped and saved to, to make sure that they could make it watertight. And then suddenly the archdeacon gave them permission that we could go back into the building. So we thought it would be great around Easter time to do this kind of community engagement prior to one of the Sunday services where Roger and I kind of um, sort of conducted this little a workshop where we asked people what what was the, the future of church what what could St Margaret's and everybody there what could they do for the community and um, it, it was quite wonderful when Andrew sent some of these black and white photographs last, last night where it just kind of brought it all flooding back it's just the warmth and I guess in these times where we're not allowed to meet we're not allowed to hug and and shake hands it's it kind of brings me back to the kind of warmth of of this day and, and this community and this project you know we just had this quite incredibly rich experience where we gathered um and you know, Fran here who you see on the right is, is the minister of the church and and um he's just the most incredible human being that, that I've learned so much from over the last 12 months and um I, I think you know we've got a long-term relationship both on this project and others and I one of my hopes for this project is that Fran will now come with us and, and talk to other people. The image on the left is Christmas last year where we had all these gas heaters trying to heat this building because we had no heating. This is all the community engagement that we gathered from, from everybody on our day. Uh, and again, it, it's quite evident when you kind of put all this into the kind of the, the, the word clouds from the brief. So, so we worked with, with Andrew and Fran and the team to kind of put together this brief and, and at this stage there were kind of three priorities it was kind of about flexible workshop it was about new entrance and threshold it was about co-working and soft play dining sleeping but that's kind of developed and, and I think once we kind of moved beyond that the most important thing was was to get heating into this building and, and the little quote here on the right sums up everything about this project come as you are no perfect people allowed so again this this was our kind of process in the feasibility study kind of sketching out um, you know, the kind of ideas about new threshold and new entrance. And I think for Roger and myself, it was all about permeability. It was about trying to open up the entrance and to make it feel like people were welcome to, to come and enjoy this building. Um, and how we might think about laying out kind of the seating within the space. And we started to begin to think about how people travel past the front of the church and how you might be sort of almost goes back to one of those images where people are hugging this, this this building needed to hug people as they as they wandered past and then we had some early ideas about you know what what the new entrance might be as a sort of mini sort of copper box as a new threshold um, and then that kind of developed a bit further we again we had this idea of this kind of community street and the the church were beginning to um basically design their own brief through through doing and and that was kind of um, they basically set up a cafe and a food bank and a, a secondhand shop. And it, it was quite incredible how the energy um, that was created started to kind of write 
um, a business plan, which which is quite incredible, really, when you start, think about you know church writing a business plan through through doing. But they started to invite people back into this building, and people started to engage. So we the, the brief has been defined and designed almost almost every day, and the amount of people coming to the cafe and the and the shop and the food bank has been quite incredible. But again, reflecting on the fact that you know not everybody's been able to kind of come to this building over the last six months is been quite challenging for everybody. So again, we were kind of thinking about, you know, what this what this new uh, threshold and entrance might be. Uh, but I think at this stage, we we kind of took a step back, and one one of the next bits of the brief that was was um, we were asked to look at was um, there's a little space at the back of the church which Andrew and the team had been developing as a little um, space for children to to kind of come and enjoy a, a sort of quiet, comfortable, intimate space, and we were asked to think about how we might put a door or a screen on, on this um, separating from the main church to the to the kind of this little chapel space. So we kind of went through, a, again, a process of sketching out, you know, various ideas about, you know, what this screen might look like and how it might interact. But it, for us, it became a pivotal moment as to thinking very carefully about new interventions within this space. We had to be really quite sympathetic and mindful. Uh, so we, we kind of settled on this um, idea that we kind of designed this little birch ply screen and a sliding door within this space, uh, and that would be very delicately added into this um, archway. So here it is. So for us, this was our kind of one-to-one -one testing model as to how we would kind of move forward with the rest of the project. And then... Um, then we had to kind of move forward with looking at getting some heating in this building. So uh, the existing floor is a, is a park, timber, timber parquet floor, which kind of slightly passed its sell by date. So we had to think about taking that up. So we took it up. It was sold onto somebody else. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, skipped. Uh, and then we started to introduce our, our new underfloor heating. Uh, local um, street artist who many of you will know, Fark, has been very involved in the church, managed to design a, a a hoarding for the project once we took the front door off. Uh, and then once we'd installed our underfloor heating, um, we were pouring beautiful polished concrete into this space to get some thermal mass. Um, we've just got planning to put some air source heat pumps to heat the space. There's Fran just kind of contemplating the new floor. Uh, and then these are some images that Fran and Andrew have been sending me across so the floor was was polished and sealed last week um so we've got heating on it's the first time that this building has had heating for i guess probably over 10 or 20 years um which is quite phenomenal and our air source heat pumps will be going in after christmas which will be plugged into the renewable tariff so this church will now have the most amazing heating system the church um did their online sunday service um, on Sunday. So you see um, these are some images that Andrew sent through. There's our little screen with the floor. And then these images were sent through last night from Fran. This is our cafe on wheels that we've designed this birch by cafe that can kind of be moved. And the idea is that this will go into our phase three entrance once it's once we've got planning and funding and we've built it. Um, and there's a little shop that's going into this space. So phase three is essentially the, the new entrance, which will have um, cafe and kind of meeting space. This will be our new threshold. These are our new toilets that have just been finished, that have just gone in. Our cafe space is gonna sit here. We've got a new shop, and then we've got a children's um, play space that's gonna be constructed within the church. So the new entrance, um, the idea is that that joins the church to the um, church hall. It's all in copper, and then it's got this little north light um, to get light deep into the space. It's become quite a glazed element as the feedback from the planners was to try and make it even more uh, permeable than we'd, we'd originally um, designed. So these, these are some of the images that we've been kind of developing as part of a plan application that was submitted back in um, September. So this, this, this again has kind of come out of that process, this idea that this building kind of hugs between the two buildings and embraces.
you can see we've got slightly obsessed with the kind of three-dimensional quality of this and we've just had this physical model mail which has been submitted as part of our plan application and again i come back to i way we and, and humanity the, the book and the film and I, I love this quote if you help one person you help humanity and this pretty much sums up everything about st margaret's andrew fran steve and everybody's involved in the community and i think um you know st margaret's is is a wonderful kind of model for for all of us to kind of be you know what we should all be doing in, in community um so i know sorry i'm i'm going on on i'm sort of running out of time here but the last the last project um which i'll very quickly talk about is something that we've been working on since september um and again this is um working with uh local community again but this is working with um, businesses in um, bedford place and carton place here in southampton um, and this has been quite a challenging project because this isn't really about architecture, this is about street activation and animation where the local authority have, have, have effectively closed this, this street. Um, so this is Carlton Place, this is, this is Bedford Place, uh, the sort of concrete bollards have been placed to close this off so that we can get um, social distancing, we can have hospitality and the nighttime industry can be out with benches and people can be sitting outside dining. Um, you can see it was all pretty bleak and uh, uh, sort of mundane with these concrete bollards that were dropped into the, to the street and these sort of rather utilitarian planters that were placed by the local authority. So we were asked to do a sort of mini feasibility study to see how we might better activate this street. So here it, here it is in the, in the centre of Southampton. Bedford Place, for those of you that don't know it, has got a kind of reputation of being slightly boutique-y and um, it's, it's quite interesting in that it's not, it's not a shopping centre, so it's outside, it's got real opportunity. It's literally about 15 minutes from where I live here. Um, but one of the key things that we were facing, every time we met with everybody, it became quite an emotive thing about closing the road. People are still obsessed by, they can only do something in a car. You can only go to the shop to get, you, you know, you can only go and get your hair cut in a car. You can only go to the dentist in a car. And we were like, well, hang on. This is, this, is, this is just becoming too emotive. So we moved the conversation to something called the 15 minute district. So some of you may well have read um, the idea of the 15 minute district and the 15 minute city. And the lady mayor uh, of Paris has begun to implement this and talk about this. And they're beginning to pedestrian whole swathes of Paris. The idea being that within a 15 minute um, kind of circular neighborhood you can kind of do everything it's walkable there's housing there's, there's transport there's schools you know you can go and get your hair cut you can get your nails done you can go and have coffee so that's the way we've kind of framed this idea it's it's we weren't appointed to kind of look at it as an urban design um situation but that's kind of where, where we've moved it to kind of move the the conversation away from people being obsessed by having to be in a car to, to do anything so this was the this was the ambition and the brief of, 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 the, of the kind of six month temporary closure of the idea to kind of decorate the concrete bollards to dress up the planters to address existing signage to improve signage. Um, to install uh, bunting and lighting and possibly paint the road and do events and even branding so we've been involved in, in kind of all of these things. Uh, and we introduced the idea of a series of acts that actually. Um, in a place like Southampton, I'm sure it's the same in Portsmouth, one of the interesting things that people like Solent Showcase here in Southampton have started to do is, is to basically treat the city as the art gallery. And we went along with that and said, well, the, it's like treating the, the city as, as a piece of theatre, that these acts need to happen. And as we propose these acts, whether it's painting the road, whether it's putting up artwork, whether it's events or, or Christmas um, lights and trees, it's, it's in this world you know, where, that we're in at the moment in, in dealing with this virus, there's an opportunity to turn the city in, into theatre and into art galleries. So we came up with this kind of mini, mini master plan as well, where we would do our various acts. And so the first act was um, Solent Showcase. We're working with um, a series of, of local street artists to kind of decorate and paint the concrete bollards and it's made a huge improvement to the place people come and, and kind of take photographs and post them on Instagram um, and it, it's kind of been really quite powerful to just start to create something different for this place and, and in an ideal world this wouldn't be a temporary closure this may well be a 
you know, a full time pedestrianisation. And, and this is this is how places like Amsterdam started. You know, if you go online and watch Amsterdam back in the 70s, when they started to do this, people were getting out of the cars and, and, and having um, punch ups. They were punching each other because it was so emotive about removing traffic of these places. So we've got these ideas, the, the Fandango kid is, is, is a young lady who is a, is a street artist, is, is quite renowned, and this piece um, was actually in, in the Tate, and, it, and it, it, at the moment it's here in Southampton, so we're hoping that we can kind of reintroduce it within this space. We've been collaborating and working with an artist um, called Amanda Moore, who's an artist and an architect, and she did this piece in, in Southampton a couple of years ago. But recently, um, she did a mini competition to look at um, creating um, this little idea that you could kind of paint on surfaces and roads and pavements where you could kind of set up this idea that children and community would get involved and it would kind of set up this idea that you could be socially distanced. So we have been working with Amanda to try and come up with ideas that if this is kind of bed for place here is to stitch this in back into the city, this is Guildhall Square, this is the car park here at Bedford Place. And the idea is, is that we kind of lay down a marker, which is a base colour in the road. And then we just kind of pixelate and allow um, children and others within the city to, to kind of add to it as we move forward. So Amanda and myself have been kind of working on this idea that if, if this is the kind of the knuckle here between Bedford Place and Carlton Place, so we've got these kind of concrete bollards here and, and we kind of lay this grid out and we, we do a little bit and then we allow it to kind of bleed into the, to the rest of the city and other people can kind of add to it. So these are some of Amanda's images. This is the latest one that we're trying to convince the local authority to kind of introduce this, uh, which is proving quite challenging at the moment because they're seeing it as more permanent, which is where we want to go. We don't want it to be temporary. In an ideal world, we're trying to get this pedestrianised full time. And then we've kind of come up with this narrative of, around this branding of place. So we came up with this idea that the key thing that joined these two places together was literally the word place. You know, so we came up with this idea that it could be a place to eat, a place for space, a place to meet, a place to date, a place to drink. And so what we're going to do is we're going to produce this branding that's going to go on social media. It's going to be part of our kind of Christmas launch. Um, we're also kind of working with artists to produce um, little stencils that we'll spray and put on the plants and things. And you can see that we've been collecting things from social media. It just kind of shows the interest in this place from Instagram. And then we've got these ideas about trying to tie the planters together with some colourful um, framework and, and again introducing this idea of, of the branding and then one of the key things is kind of developing these kind of photo montages uh, where we've been quite wild and provocative but we feel we need to do this to, to kind of animate and and to kind of articulate where, where we might go with this as a, as a as a project kind of painting the road the planters inflatables on roofs and then we've kind of been producing nighttime images as well. So at the moment we've got the bollards in, we've got the tree up and, and now we just need to kind of get a bit further forward. Uh, the, the lights will be going up quite soon as well. And then again, this is, this is Carlton Place, kind of stitching this in as well. And the idea is to try and, you know, to, to try and really make it a destination place to kind of convince people that you don't have to get in your car, you don't have to go to an internal shopping centre, you can, you can come and social, socially distance and, and, and meet people and, 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 you know, have some form of, you know, social life outside of, of the current situation we find ourselves in. So we've got this kind of slightly wild idea about projecting onto buildings, this is the main entrance into, into Bedford Place. And then we've been trying to introduce everybody to, you know, the, the, over, the overall arching ideas through precedent images. Uh, one of the real challenges has been trying to convince the local authority to hold a market, which is obviously quite um, difficult at the moment. So we're trying to do late night shopping in a couple of weeks where we're going to have a, a, some form of event. And then we have this idea about possibly doing an urban Christmas tree. I mean, you know, maybe we'll get around to doing that next Christmas. And the idea of inflatables to kind of animate and, and draw people in. And kind of this is this is where it is at the moment with the Christmas tree and the bollards. This was last Friday, I think. So um, 
kind of that's where where we're at at the moment. And then interestingly, off the back of this, <clears throat> we've just been approached by Eastleigh Borough Council to go and uh, do something similar, looking at the high street there, which is a slightly bigger project. Um, and I just want to leave you with this quote, really. This kind of sums up kind of where we are at the moment as a practice, but it sums up life generally. In this time of uncertainty, we need more tolerance, compassion and trust for each other since we're all as one. Otherwise, humanity will face an even bigger crisis. Thanks very much. Um, I guess any questions, really? Hi, Darren, thanks for that. Um, no. I'd just like to ask how you felt um, this has reached the wider community on kind of each of these projects or maybe just one in particular in terms of, you know, you've had this very collaborative working with your clients and that actually the schemes have evolved kind of through that process. Um, but what has been, been the sense of how this has been received amongst our general wider public? Well, every project is different. I mean, the the high street project is highly emotive uh, because everybody sees uh, basically they say their human rights have been removed because they can't drive down the street. Um, so that becomes really quite challenging at times. But I think the thing that we have learned is that it's all about deep listening. And that is the thing that most architects find really bloody hard. And I'll include myself in that is that you have to, with these types of projects, and I think in this day and age, you have to listen and you have to listen really hard. And if somebody tells you something once, if they tell you a second time, then you need to go back and look at that drawing and, and attempt to do that. And every Friday we have meetings with the traders online and there are two or three people that are really quite vociferous and I've had to learn to develop a second thick skin. Um, but we had a major breakthrough on, on Friday because we basically reduced and, and diluted some of the thinking and some of the drawings. And, and suddenly we had this massive outpouring of people who wanted to get involved, particularly on the road painting, because um, we started to introduce the idea of doing workshops and working with schools and children. Suddenly all the adults wanted to get involved. They wanted to paint the road. So I've learned a huge amount there. Um, and I think, I think um, it's kind of really important to kind of reach out as much as you can. I know that's really difficult because, you know, when, when we first started working with um, St. Margaret's, um, we said we weren't going to propose anything until everybody had started to get back into the church and started to use it. And that was just phenomenal because Fran and Andrew and Stephen and everybody involved started to kind of design the way forward through the idea of cafe and food bank and shop. Um, and I think, I've learned a great deal about, you know, architects have this reputation of steaming in and going, I know what the solution is. I know what the concept is. I know what the party diagram is. That's bollocks. You know, in this day and age, you have to listen and listen really hard because you will learn a great deal and the project will become richer. So I think I've waffled there quite a lot, Melina. I don't even know if I've answered your question. In, in a roundabouts way, I think you got there. Thank you. Hi, Darren. It's Rachel. Um, Hi. Hi, thanks for your talk. I think that was really lovely and perfect for architecture students and in the interior students as well. Um, and a really lovely scale. And I really appreciate your reference to the current climate and COVID and this idea of social engagement. And I think one of the things I really loved about it is that the projects seem attainable. So we're talking to our third year students about how they might see their, their practice in the future. And that they're gonna have to be quite fleet of foot and creative in the way that they generate work and think about setting up practice. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. And then the other thing is, I'd be really interested to know what you've learned by working with other creative disciplines, like the artist, for example. Because again, we talk to, in interiors, and I'm sure in architecture too, we talk to the students, um, I'm thinking of my thir the third year students at the moment, but in all year groups, we really talk to them about looking beyond their own discipline and the wider cultural context of what they do. So, yeah, I think those are, two, those are two great questions and and, um, and they are really at the heart of what we do. Um, so I think in, in terms of talking about practice, um, it's really interesting, you know, since what's happened with the virus in the last six months, 
um, we've realized that there are more opportunities now than there were six months ago. And, you know, I get a general sense from other practices and architects that they probably wouldn't gravitate to some of these projects because they would use this classic phrases, there's not enough architecture in it for us. Um, but, I, I, and again, coming back to your other question, we, we're not interested in designing everything. That's just a complete nonsense, you know, it, particularly on, on projects like um, the high street, I, I basically want to be a kind of curator. I don't, I don't need or feel the will to be able to, to design everything, you know, because actually the project becomes richer, you, you, you learn more. And actually if you create, curate something, you can bring more people to the table and, and you can get more out of it. And, and, and I believe that, you know, lots of other creative disciplines like artists are much better than architects at, at kind of being able to deliver things at speed, at budget. Whereas we just get tied up in the bigger, you know, ideal and the bigger picture. But actually we're applying all this stuff now to domestic projects, you know, where clients have said, well, I've only got X and I've got a farmhouse and I want to get from here to here. And you say, okay, well, we'll do it in a meanwhile solution. And they kind of look at you slightly bizarrely. You say, well, you know, let's take bits and chunks off and, 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 and do it strategically. Um, so I think there's a great deal for us as architects to be collaborating, to be able to push these projects on. There really is. Um, and, um, and again, I think we just need to get over ourselves as architects being able to do everything. I mean, the reason that we get so much work from the bid here, Go Southampton, of the guys that have appointed us on the high street, is because the chief exec likes the fact that allegedly I don't have an ego. Um, and, and the fact that we're quite comfortable allowing, bringing other people to the table. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a great deal to learn for students in, in kind of this process. It's, um, it, 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 it's, I mean, we talk about collaboration all the time, but I think, I think this goes further than that. It's, it's, it's about kind of, you know, sharing, sharing the, the kind of creative endeavor and, and, um, you know, I, and I love working with the church because, you know, we just kind of bounce off each other and everybody brings something to the table every week. And, and again, nobody's got any ego. It's just about one shared vision. And I think that's the key is if you've got a shared vision, it, it, it's not a problem. And that's the thing that we found really hard on the high street is to try and bring everybody to a shared vision. And we got really close on, on Friday. I'm just hoping the local authority are going to back us and mm. keep going. Well, good luck and thank you. That, that's great. Thanks. Darren, uh, this is Lois Lorne. Can I was just, can I ask, is it in partnership with Sustrans work? Or... Um, so, so they've been doing some PR work. Um, so I don't know if you know uh, Megan, Megan Streb, who's, who's here in Southampton. She heads up Sustrans here. So they've been doing some, uh, making some films to kind of promote it. Um, and they're kind of, they're kind of um, promoting it in the background. Um, it's quite interesting in a way because um, the local authority kind of shut the road and then walked away and dropped us, all of us in it. <laughs> and we've done that to kind of deal with the, all the emotion and everything else and not having much budget. Um, but I'm hoping that there's gonna be, this will be a conversation that will continue in the city. Even, even if we don't manage to do what we need to do here, it, it will move on to the kind of green infrastructure plan that the that the Labour Council have here in Southampton. Yeah, I was just thinking, I, the last thing I, I saw was the concrete um, barriers when I took my son to buy his school shoes in the summer. Um, and there was there was none of the graffiti or the artwork um, that you're showing now, which looks absolutely wonderful. Um, so yeah, I really, I really hope you get approval for it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Darren, it's, uh, it's Andrew here. I just wanted to, um, Add something to uh, Rachel's uh, to your response to Rachel's, if you if you if you don't mind, really, just to reinforce the the approach that you and Roger both bought brought to to us as clients. Uh, the meanwhile approach, I recall sitting in the sitting in the. I think it was in the hall, wasn't it? Or maybe it was sitting on the floor in in, in the cold little office, uh, and seeing the look of revelation on on, on Mike and Fran's faces when uh, when they realised they didn't have to find. A million and a half pounds in one go they could find 
<laughs> £50,000 or £10,000 or £5,000 or whatever your modest fee was for, the, for that, uh, really, <laughs> you know, that £300, I think. Uh, and, that, and that is such a powerful thing for, for all of all uh, people who practice that you, you can, the vision is, is critical. And you said that really clearly. But to build into the vision, you can build it in stages and you can move towards it. And particularly with a kind of quite a fluid place like a, like a church like this church, like St. Margaret's, where the vision does adapt to, to the needs. I mean, who would have thought that we would have been serving 5,000 people in the past six months at a food bank out of a couple of containers whilst we were having a polished concrete floor uh, installed? Who would have thought that when we, when we were sitting on that floor? Nobody thought that. We had a cupboard, which is about the size of one of these cupboards behind me here, with a few few packets of rice in it. Um, and, and it's that idea of the fluidity of the solution and and how adaptable the vision can be, whilst keeping the thing the thing, as you'll recall, we, we say regularly, uh, is a very powerful way of, of doing that. And that, that's something that I think everybody tuned into this can really take home. The students who are, who are thinking of setting up their own practice, it's, it's just having something that's achievable fits in with a large scale and and that's and it's brilliant it's utterly brilliant thank you andrew well it's been it's been a delight working with you and everybody and we, you know as i say we're continuing to learn and i think that's the most important thing for for everybody that's still studying and maybe thinking about launching their own practice is that if you're not if you're not learning um then you know you're not doing it right <laughs> Darren, I just want to make sure that you've seen the um, questions in the chat. There's a couple there from people. Yeah, I've just... Um, how can we as young architects and designers tackle greater world issues through our work, but also respecting the given context we're working? Wow, that's quite a question. Um, I mean, I think, I think the thing that I've really learned from the last two years setting up in practice is it's that, you know, you can't do everything. And it goes back to, you know, what I was just saying about not designing everything is, is pick something that you're really passionate about. And it might be, you know, going to work in a particular country, doing a particular thing. For us, it was about just engaging with community and seeing what we could, seeing what we could do. And, you know, I think if enough young students want to go and do things that are going to make a, a, an influence in the world is to just pick one or two things to deal with because you can't you can't do everything um and that's what we're finding now that's that we're getting you know really incredibly busy and we're in the new year we're going to have to probably you know drop some of the typologies that we're working on and that might not be a bad thing to working with domestic clients um so um you know it's it's about focus i think um i'm just trying to see what are the as an architect how do you see community movements such as Pride and Billam coming together and move forward for a brighter future. And um, I mean, I think the, the one way for that to happen is for architects to, to get involved in that. And to, and to, I think architects get, need to get more political. I mean, my brother phoned me up the week ago and, and um, he said, I think you should run for office. And I said, you know, what the hell are you on about? And he said, I, I honestly think you should go into politics. And I said, well, I'm trying to build a practice at the moment, but I think architects, I think architects need to roll the sleeves up and understand politics and communities because there is going to be an awful lot of opportunity for us to to do this stuff and i think the more that we get involved in in this stuff the better um you know when i see things that have been written in the press this week about particular individuals that head up you know multinational architectural practices and all they're interested in is is you know is the dollar and you know, not addressing climate change and not addressing you know social and simple issues, um, it just kind of you know my heart sinks really. So I think as architects we need to become you know more ethical and 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 just get involved in in this stuff. Aaron, could I could I chip in? Go for it, Roger. Uh, you and I have known each other for um, a long time. And I'd like to thank you for a really inspirational talk. But the one thing for me that sets you apart is around this issue of humility. And I wonder if you'd like to develop that a bit, because it seems to me that uh, a lot of architecture and interior architecture is about imposition. 
And you used the word listen deep earlier. And I, I thought that was a really profound phrase to to use. And I I just wonder if you could you could work that up a bit. Yeah, well, I mean <clears throat> I, I think it's um <clears throat> I think going back to this idea of deep listening, it's 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 quite simple really in a concept. It's just about reflection. So if 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 a client or a client body or a community says something or raises something, I think you have to take a step back, go and think about you know that thought or that question or that 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 kind of phrase that they've they've sort of reflected back to you, and try and. Um, not disarm them, but to, to kind of, um, as an architect, to kind of find a creative way of, of dealing with that as a, as a situation. And, and, and we're, we're learning quite a lot on the high street where every week there is a very profound grenade that's thrown into the, into the conversation. And that's quite hard because every week you have to kind of go back and think about how you're going to address that the next week. Uh, and we had one of these moments on on Friday where and there's a question that's come in about, you know, children led participation. And we took a step back. We did some deep listening and we just kind of um, took the idea back to its kind of component parts. So the road painting, we've now changed to like a grid. That's partly because we wanted to reflect and say to people, OK, we're not going to completely paint everything some colour that nobody likes. Uh, but also the idea of the grid was then something that children and schools we could do workshops with and they could begin to add to. So, you know, the, the whole idea about deep listening is that if, if somebody says something to you, they say it for a reason. They don't say it because they're just trying to get something off their chest. And if you ignore that, if you ignore that, then um, you don't have permission to then move on to the next part of the project. Um, and I remember, Roger, when we started the project at St Margaret's, when we put together some precedent images and everybody in the church, we thought they were going to be quite provocative. And they said, yeah, we love those, but let's go a bit further than that. Let's, let's, you know, let's go further. And I, and I think it's about trying to get permission from clients and community groups to go further and further. Um, so that I think that's how the kind of the deep listening is, is, is if you listen and you and you react and you reflect, then you get the permission to go to the next stage, if that makes sense. Any more questions? Darren. Hi, hey. can you hear me? Hi, uh, excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I really particularly enjoyed the quotes at the end of each uh, project that came up and your interest in community and architecture is you know, very clear to see. Um, I'm particularly interested to hear more on your thoughts on sustainability and how you approach that with with your clients and how you kind of incorporate that within your work yeah i mean i mean i didn't go into massive amounts of, of that on the church because we were you know uh, trying to talk about um community but with with the church um when we started to talk about the infrastructure of that building that's been quite challenging because as you can imagine the size and the space of that we'd have blown the budget if we were trying to thermally improve that building. So we brought on board Mesh Energy to work with us to try and find a solution where we could put heating into that building, but not fundamentally change the fabric, but we could give the church an opportunity to do uh, more activities in that building. So again, our, our real passion is working with existing buildings where we can. Um, I think probably 90 to 95% of our projects are dealing with existing buildings. You know, so for example, at the moment, we're working on a farmhouse just outside Reading, where we're doing a huge thermal upgrade of that building. And then we're adding on a little contemporary extension to that project. Um, and I, I, again, I think there's huge amounts of opportunity for architects to be working on existing buildings because it takes a bit more time and energy for, for architects and clients. But I, I think we should be doing more to kind of respect and reuse existing fabrics that are around every town and city. Um, I know lots of architects think it's really easy to just take a huge chunk of countryside and put, you know, five, 600 square meters of 
contemporary house. Um, but that's not that's not really an eco house that some people call them. Um, I mean, I'd like to think St Margaret's could be could be termed as a you know a sustainable um, building and a sustainable model. Um, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think if there were more of us working on existing buildings, then you know we'd certainly start to you know try and reduce you know a great deal of landfill um and, and again we're trying to do as much as we can on our on our projects and um yeah so i think yeah if, if we can do more with existing buildings i think that's the way to go any more questions oh hello 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 um your graffiti work like the day you use for Portsmouth and in Southampton do you see that as like I don't know like a way of expressing you know voices about like oh not voices but like political with what was happening around the world like do you find that's like an ex creative way of expressing that for the communities absolutely Just what they do in Bristol that absolutely yeah yeah I mean it, it's it, it's been quite a challenging um, situation where it is in Southampton because um, Bedford Place and Carton Place has, has, has got this kind of tradition as being a heavily Georgian boutique-y um, place uh, so that's been quite a challenge for some people to get their heads around that but the way that we've been selling it is that, that there's a daytime economy and a nighttime economy and and actually when you look at it in the kind of Covid world at the moment you know the two need to somehow try and coexist because they can actually bounce off each other but uh, I think it's I think it's really really important to kind of see more of that and, and it's really interesting that nobody's graffitied over the concrete bollards because people have kind of stood back and said well actually somebody's put some time energy and thought into that and um, and I think you know if if I had my way we'd be doing all sorts of additional stuff up there you know we'd be doing kind of post up walls and and um, taking it a step further um, Any other questions? I'm just trying to look through. Hi, Darren. Hi, Bill. How you doing? Yeah, good, mate. How are you? Not bad. Long time no see. Yeah. Um, so Portsmouth recently have started sort of integrating bike routes throughout the city. Um, and I know Elm Grove has been a sort of trial uh, by fire at the moment. They've sort of painted over a green alley down the side of the road and put some bollards through it. How Oh, not how, but um, yeah, how, how can that be more successful? Because initially it was, I think, run over by cars and things. It was taking up where there was parking. What would make that a more successful integration into the city rather than just a sort of implementation by a sort of over-engineered system in your mind? Or you know, um, how, how can you be more successful with it in Southampton? By closing off roads. well we've, we've had the same challenges here where um you've got a labor controlled council that have implemented that as a green strategy in response to covid and mm. then you've got um another political party that has decided to whip up um uh, an offense against that um the kind of pro car lobby um and i think it's it's exactly the same stuff that we're facing on the on the high street project is that you've got to you've got to know that you're going to face um, some real challenges and some real vociferous uh, input from certain parts of the community. But you've got to you've got to have vision and you've got to stick with it. And the other thing that we're just starting to do now is to is to try and do um, not community engagement, but carry out surveys to see actually how many people are pro it and how many people are not pro it and if they're not pro it why are they not pro it and and being able to talk to people about you know i mean when, when i go and get my hair cut at bedford place they all know i'm working on this project and i literally you know get for a half an hour they're all at me saying i can't believe you're involved in that and you close the road and blah 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 and what i do is i turn the conversation around to climate change and their children and their grandchildren and suddenly um the conversation changes because then they'll say to me, oh, what do you think is going to get worse? And I say, what, climate change or the virus? Uh, and when I say there's probably a good 
chance that climate change and the virus are going to make it more challenging, suddenly that's a way of disarming people because when you make it an, uh, an emotional and emotive thing, um, people start to kind of reflect on that. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think the other thing is that local councils have to keep their nerve. You know, I, I talked earlier about there are videos out there of, you know, black and white videos of 1970s in Amsterdam with people getting out of their cars, removing bollards like that, and people literally having punch-ups in the street. So this stuff has happened before, but people have to keep their nerve, because if you don't keep the nerve and you give in, you go back to the status quo, and we can't go back to the status quo, because the virus is linked to climate change. The climate change is linked to the virus, you know, and as, as designers or architects, you know, we've, we've got to move the conversation to that place. And we and I'm learning a great deal working with the client on on the high street by keeping my nerve because every time I go, oh, should we just no? Do not change the drawing. No, do not dilute it. Keep your nerve. Oh, I, wait, maybe we should change the colour. No, do not. Um, uh, and so I'm having to learn some hard lessons there because you know I like to try and listen and change, but we've got the kind of flip side happening here. So um, can I? Sorry, could I chip in again? Go on then. Yeah, just say that's one reason I no longer go, go to hairdressers. <laughs> <laughs> but more seriously, I remember you and I having a very, very long conversation no. in, into the night about the imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I just wonder whether... For students gathered here today, it, it might be something you might want to elaborate upon to, to give people more confidence in, in their ability and their potentials. Yeah, well, you know, one, one, of the, one of the reasons that I kind of, you know, suffer from the kind of imposter syndrome is probably linked back to my struggles with dyslexia. But um, every project that I do now, working with people like Andrew and Fran and the bookshop and, and, and Giles, who's my client on the, on the, on the high street, you know, when, when I talk to them and they reflect back to me, you know, why it's been a success. Um, I think I'm getting a little bit better. Um, but actually, um, I think there's something about having had challenges in your life, whether it's dyslexia or feeling you're imposter because actually you get up every morning and it's a bit like, right, I'm going to go again. <laughs> and then I'm going to go again. Um, and, and it's a bit like stress testing you or, or a practice. Um, and I quite like the idea of kind of stress testing stuff. Um, and it's not being scared to fail. It's not being scared to kind of try things. I mean, I, you know, I always come back to you know, people that have kind of done it and made it, you know, people like Apple and Steve Jobs who had this kind of theory that you, you designed and you built something to a certain level, but you didn't perfect it. There's no point perfecting it because actually perfection is, is, doesn't exist. So chuck it out into the world and stress test it. And I guess that's kind of what we're doing with some of the projects that actually by incrementally doing some of these, you're kind of stress testing opportunities and where you might get to. And, you know, if you stress test six ideas and they don't come off, that's fine because, you know, one or two of them might come off and they might be the biggies. Um, and that's kind of for what we do with the process. You know, when we're doing a feasibility study, we're kind of testing and testing and testing. Probably drives most of our clients mad, but I don't want to get into a situation where we haven't tried something. Yeah, it drives me mad. <laughs> 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 no it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> it's brilliant because it, that's that's how you architecture is about narrative and it's about iterative processes in, in in my humble opinion and uh you know that's how you end up with something extraordinary uh like the things that you've uh, you've shown us tonight darren thank you i'm gonna have to disappear so i shall thank you darren very much for your wonderful uh lecture and i will see you soon i hope thank you andrew thanks for the photographs Any more questions? Sorry, we've gone way over what you probably normally do. That's that's because I've just been waffling. I
Oh, sorry, I do have one more question. You was talking about having dyslexia. Have you always found that as as a tr as a struggle with doing architecture, or how have you how have you handled your dyslexia? Can I ask? It's it's got better the longer I've gone on into my career. Um, I, I, I guess it's it gets better when I'm you know I've got wonderful people like Andrew and Roger who you know tell me to you know get a grip and stop stop um, questioning myself. Um, it's I guess it, you become more confident around it, um, but it, you know, it's been a massive struggle uh, early on. Um, but I, you know, to be honest, I have a huge amount to thank people that are involved in Portsmouth School of Architecture. I mean, there was a wonderful, wonderful lady called Wendy Potts who used to be the head of school who called me into my her office back in sort of 1993 at the end of my first year and said, "I've just read your essay. Really interesting." but I think you're dyslexic. And I had no idea. I'd gone through my whole primary and secondary education where literally every teacher had told me that, you know, I wasn't going to amount to much. And um, they laughed in my mother's face when they, I, she suggested I might want to go and study architecture. So I always joked that I gate crashed the architectural industry. I somehow managed to, you know, get there. But that part of that is down to Roger. It's Roger's fault that I've got this far because he believed in, in me at sort of 16 and, then kicked me out the front door of his office and said, off you go to university. And I said, what? I never thought about going to university. Um, and it's about, it's about having really, it's about having role models. It's about having people that believe in you. And that, and again, I, I guess that's why I'm so passionate about teaching that, you know, even, even in like week one or two of a first year studio, I just see something in people. And I think actually, you know, they, there's something about them and, and, you know, people that come from, amazing difficult lives in difficult parts of the world and they just they've landed here in the UK and you just think actually I can see something quite special in that person. Yeah, thank you. I I read something the other day Darren that um, talked about disability not disability and I I, I kind of think that's a wonderful way to think about challenges that we all face yeah. that that somehow you know challenges with with words produce um potentials with creativity and you know all of these things are about different ways of of being being in the world and i think we really need to recalibrate because i bet if we took a straw poll amongst the meeting tonight, we would sense that many of us have challenges with words. But that gives us other abilities, and I think we should celebrate that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, totally. Can I, can I say something, Darren? Yes, Francis, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine. I, I just want to say that, um, and, and I, I don't know whether you you have the same experience, but uh, I kind of think that uh, some of the best students I've ever had are dyslexic, <laughs> simply because they think holistically, and therefore they they don't they don't think linearly and logically. They think in in a, in a completely different way, and and I kind of think it's. You know, there are plenty of architects like Richard Rogers is dyslexic. <laughs> there are plenty of architects who are dyslexic, and I think I think it's not a, it's not a disadvantage. It's actually an advantage in my book. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think that piece about you know linear Francis is a is a key thing, um, and that's probably something that I really labour in studio um, with with students is to. Is to just not think in this kind of linear way, and it, and I and I think that's I think that's absolutely spot on in particularly in the projects we're working on in practice is that there is nothing linear about any of our projects, and and it'd be quite interesting I think to kind of look at practices and the way that they're what they design and the way that they design and the outcomes because most of our projects are you know are these kind of you know stopping pivoting changing direction you know stepping back um 
So yeah, I think there's I think there's definitely something in that. But but also there's something in that about us as as, as teachers being able to teach people in that kind of creative problem solving that. Um, you know, you might get some parts of a project. It goes back to, you know, that discussion I was having with Roger a minute ago about, you know, once you've got the kind of um, permission to move on, you know, you get that kind of way to kind of be a bit more linear. But early parts of a project, you know, I think, I think you need to be really quite open. Anybody else? No. Lots of questions anyway. Never had so many questions. <laughs> it's been a good discussion. <laughs> Somebody's just asking, when are you planning to teach at Portsmouth? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that is a good question. I was supposed to be doing part three examining next week, but then um, then I found out that I knew three of the candidates from uh, third year many years ago, so I had to be stood down. Um, so I do I do still dip my toe in at Portsmouth, and, and Roger and I were involved in the first year project last year, which was based on St Margaret's. Um, um, if somebody invites me, I'll come down and do some crits, particularly if we can do some face to face stuff in um, you know in twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two. Um, I'd love to. Um, I'm, I must admit, I'm finding it. I mean, I only do two weeks at Reading at the moment, and that's quite challenging given how busy the practice is. Um, so, somebody invite me down, and I shall come. We will, Darren. Trust me. <laughs> Can I? Um, you know, I've known you since you were 15, um, and. I would just like to sincerely thank you for your contribution tonight. I mean, it's been really, really inspiring. Um, I think that you're actively recalibrating the word architect to be much more meaningful, much less impositional. Um, and I would say more power to your elbow. And you're showing new ways of practicing, which are really inspiring and leave perhaps undated models behind so you know as a mate uh, as a colleague i'd just like to say thank you very much thank you Roger. that means a lot oh, great that really does mean a lot um but yeah we're definitely up for you know redefining redesigning recalibrating architectural practice i mean i know i know you had a talk a couple of weeks ago or a week ago by peers i mean i I hold Piers up as a as a bit of a role model in terms of um, Piers teachers at Reading as well, and, and he's he's somebody else who's kind of redefining architectural practice, and I think that's really quite exciting. Yeah, I know we're in really difficult times, but I think those of us that are running sort of mini micro practices, we've got an opportunity. You know, the, the, the playing field is beginning to level a little. Agreed. Do you think that the current times are? Um going to form a sort of catalyst of world change then is that sort of where you see it going i know on facebook you're quite outspoken um i just want to sort of know your opinions on sort of global events i guess and where you see the world sort of going with it and that's that's why my brother phoned me up last week and he said, I've been keeping a close eye on all your Facebook posts. And basically, you need to stand for office and I'll be your campaign manager. <laughs> he got he got short thrift because I said, you know, I don't have time for that, but maybe one day. And he's not the first person to say that. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing that I'm I mean, I think by the end of this year, we're going to be in an interesting place, aren't we? We're going to have a new president in the White House who's, who's going to have a very different um view of the world we're going to be moving out of this current situation where we're still going to have to deal with the virus but um you know you guys the next generation are the ones that have got to pick up the baton now and run with it and make a lot of noise and and everything that you talk about needs to be related to climate change i'm afraid um because that's where we need to get to but that doesn't mean it can be boring it, it's going to be boring it's, it's going to be quite exciting i think that 
you know, creative problem solvers like everybody here this evening can go and can go and make a difference. And and you know, we have really jo- adult conversations at Reading about architects going to be politicians or, you know, just because you've studied architecture doesn't mean you have to be, you know, a pure architect. Um, and I'm hopeful now that, you know, certain political um, endeavours that we've seen over the last five years will begin to wane and we will see a new, a new, you know, model. Uh, we're going to see new models for everything, aren't we? Let's face it. Yeah. We've just been through in the last six months. No, thank you very much. It's been really informative. Thanks, Bill. Cheers, mate. Yeah, thanks for speaking, Darren. It's been really inspiring. Thank you so much. It's been so good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. This will be on YouTube as well. Um, We usually upload all of them. Oh, thank you. Great. Yeah, if you could send me the link, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, we'll we'll do. It'll be up uh, by tomorrow, I think. Cool. Well done, Darren. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, Darren. Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Bye.